Everyone, this is Three Questions with Jason McKenna. There we go, man. Good to be here. Jason in the house. Jason's actually here from Pittsburgh today, even though Philly just got into the Super Bowl last night as we were recording <laughs> this, but we don't want to talk about that. Just like We yeah, heard the reverberations all the way over here. Yeah. yeah, you just had to get six quarterbacks, had to get hurt for you to win that game, but whatever. That's a whole other conversation. No, I'm just kidding. Good shout out to the shout out to the to the, uh, the I was gonna say the 76ers, but the Eagles. Sorry. Yeah, congrats, yeah, congratulations sport, to them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, getting my sports mix up here. So Jason, actually, great to have you on the podcast. Jason has has a new book out, and it is called "What STEM Can Do for Your Classroom: Improving Student Problem Solving, Collaboration, and Engagement." And it's for grades K to six specifically, but I'm sure that all educators could benefit from this. So before we get into three questions, Jason, can you just give people a little bit synopsis about what this book is? Yeah. Th again, thank you for having me Your on. Pleasure. Basically, I wrote this book because I know the struggles that I had when I was trying to teach those things you just mentioned in the classroom, whether it's around collaboration, student problem solving, creativity, assessment. These are things that I was often asked to do in the classroom, but I was really lacking a practical how-to guide and we'll be able to implement them effectively in the classroom. So what I really wanted to do was write a book that, first of all, came from an approach of humility. I don't have all the answers saying that this is going to work for every teacher in every situation, but this is what I have seen work in different situations all around the world, that I want to be able to provide teachers with the guidance, with practical strategies, inspiration where it's needed, so they can really take their teaching to the next level. There are so many teachers, especially K-6, to I like to say they've been voluntold to do more STEM in their classroom, <laughs> right, whether it's right. to teach a standalone STEM class or to integrate more technology in their math or more technology into their science class, whatever it is. If, they're being, if they've been voluntold to do that or if they just have their own eagerness to do it, I want to be able to provide them with a guide that was effective for them. I love that. And one of the things I really appreciate you sharing, I think is really important, is the idea that you're not like, telling people how to do stuff. You're just sharing your learning. And if they that's, take it, they can learn from it. They can modify it. I love that. Yeah, that's exactly right. There are people that, you know, want to do STEM as an after school club. There are people that want to do STEM as a three week summer camp. There are people yeah. that want to do STEM once a week in a special. And there are people that want to do it every day, 365 days a year. So whatever it is, I want to be able to provide guidance for them. And then the thing I say all the time, George, is if you think of something like Google, think about how big Google is. There are still people that use Microsoft Word. They don't have 100% market share. So for me to stand up here and say, this is the solution for everyone, that's just crazy. And I know it's not. I want to make sure this comes from a perspective of someone that's humble, someone that tried a lot of these things in the classroom. I tell people all the time, I was probably the worst teacher in the world when it came to collaboration. Right. My kids hated group work in my classroom. So trying to take that perspective and learn from that and say what actually would have helped me in the classroom and just try to share that with more teachers love it love it there are for, i'm gonna give a little shout out to all the people that use the bing <laughs> <laughs> right. is that still a thing is this i don't still know around? i don't know okay uh, is that even what it's called is it bing is that what the, it is Bing. Like, yeah okay. yeah yeah, show for the one person using thing, game yeah. out here. So that's awesome. Anyway, Jason actually does a lot of work in the and the company you work with is called Vex. Is that correct? Correct. Vex Robotics. And so that's, correct. that's what he does. But you've also, and I love this about you and I appreciate it, is that you also said you've been an educator for 20 plus years as well. So you yeah. bring those fields. And I love, I'm finding that we're, I'm connecting with more and more people that are business, businesses are tapping into that have education backgrounds and it shows like all the stuff that you can teach because a lot of these businesses are realizing how important it is to be adaptable, to be able to really kind of learn on the fly. And so I appreciate that. So from your experience as an educator, you look back and you mentioned about the collaboration thing. So you've had some ups and downs of a career like all of us have had. You look back at, and you think about the teachers that you've worked with or who taught you, who's someone in, who has inspired you and why? Yeah, so I'll take this a slightly different approach. And I tell this story in the introduction to my book. I was a first year teacher and the woman across the hall from me, we'll just say her name is Michelle. She was one of these teachers, the last three months of the year, she shut her classroom down. Didn't do what anything you would refer to as traditional teaching and basically had her kids perform skits and plays and do things like that. And as a first year teacher, I remember looking down on her thinking I would never do that. We had a new principal that year when I got hired and he was, he would talk about how basically I never want to see you do that when you're teaching, stick with what you're doing. She retired that year. Fast forward a year later, a bunch of friends and myself 
we decide we're all going to run a leg of the Pittsburgh. So we're all in a warm up area. We all wearing Hope Hopewell t-shirts because we were fundraising and had a gentleman come up to me, saw the Hopewell on my shirt and said, hey, do you graduate from Hopewell? I teach there. He says, I graduate from Hopewell and proceeds to tell me how he's an orthopedic surgeon, very successful, says to me, hey, when I was in fifth grade, I was a troubled kid. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was head down the basically the path wrong. And this one teacher turned my life around everything that I have right now, I would have hurt. And it was that teacher that I looked down upon my first year teaching. I never forgot that story. I've told that story numerous times because again, nothing works everywhere. Something's going to work somewhere. And I think having that humility and understanding that each classroom has its own context, each student has its own context that they bring in and trying to think about that from the perspective of teaching and learning, I think it is very important. And and just to connect it back to the book again, one of the things that I try to do with the book is just basically talk about, you have all these different camps in education. You have people saying that the teaching of knowledge is very important and things like direct instruction are important. Then you have people saying that the discovery-based learning is important and we shouldn't be doing direct things like direct instruction. We should be allowing the kids to learn these things on their own. And basically what I try to say is I try to say, listen, there's all these different competing things out here. Here's what's worked for me. Here's what I think is effective. But I want to give you the means to find out what's going to work for you and your students. I love that. That's such a great story too. And it, like, I actually wrote this down that sometimes what is valued in education is not often, is not always what's valuable in education. Yeah. And really thinking about that too, right? And well, saying you, you should be doing this, but what do you can remember? How does it affect them as they move forward? I love that. And you talked about business, and this is something I believe, this is why oftentimes teachers are very effective when they go into the business world. And then conversely, this is why you're seeing so many things around teachers burn. When you think about why people get involved in education. They love children. They love seeing the light bulb go off. They, get, they love the subject that they're teaching. But what, as teachers, what they're assessed upon, none of those conversations normally ever happen. You don't have a conversation about what really can lit the fire for your students there, or what really did this or that. Whereas in business, it's the exact opposite. We're so worried about retaining good talent that we oftentimes want to have those conversations with the people that work with us and say things like, hey, what are you enjoying the work? What do you want to do to continue to challenge yourself? What are the things that really make sure that you enjoy coming to work every single day? But sadly, mm -hmm. those are conversations that teachers rarely have. I love that. That's a great story, Jason. I really appreciate you sharing that. I'm going to actually, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to get you to write a blog post on that for me. Sure. Jason. Absolutely. Love hey. to. All right, you just saved me. A, you just saved me a blog post too, because I, I'm, I I got to get that story out to a bigger audience. I love that. So the next question, and you talked about men having those conversations and thinking, you know, differently about that. So when you look back at your career, who's someone that really inspired you as an administrator? Really felt that maybe empowered you that you saw as like someone that had an impact. Who's an administrator that inspires you and why? The administrator to this day, and I'm biased because he's one of my best friends, but the administrator to this day that really inspires me is Dr. Dan Castagna. He's the administrator at Woodland Hill School District, which is right here in Pittsburgh. It's about a 10 minute drive from my office right now. The reason why I find him so inspiring is his mother was a teacher, his father was a teacher, his grandfather's on the school board, his sister's a teacher right now. His whole family's educators and everything that he does from when he was an assistant principal to when he's now as a superintendent has been through the lens of what can I do to help my teachers? And oftentimes what I have found with, and I've worked with a lot of different administrators when I was in the classroom, oftentimes when teachers become administrators or administrators come in, they want to be the champion of the students, which is a hundred percent, a noble thing to be able to do. But unfortunately, when they take that approach, it oftentimes comes with antagonism towards the actual teachers. If you were just doing this, or if that just happened, we would be able to do better with our students. And the thing that I always said, I always try to talk to administrators about, is that your teachers, if you're effective, are gonna be here for 30 years. They're gonna be here for 35 years. So the impact that they can have on students over that period of time is really hard to believe. So you have to maintain that focus on your teachers while still championing what you want to do from a student learning perspective. And the best example I've always found of that is Dr. Stagger. That's like, I, I would actually say one of my biggest weaknesses as administrator, when I look back and think I, I was always an advocate of doing what's best for kids. And I say this, and I say this as a Nate, like I'm saying, like, how is that a negative? Because I felt sometimes I would forego what was best for teachers and focus on kids. But typically when you do everything you can to serve teachers, that is going to help kids the most. And so I always look at that and think, what are some ways I could have 
done things different to ensure that staff were really supported in that pursuit of best kids that we weren't, it wasn't us versus them, but it was a partnership in serving kids. And so I appreciate that too. And I think it's important for me to say, hey, yeah, that's, some, that's a place where I wish I could have done better. And I know, and I, I try to make sure I share that story. So people think about that too, so that people currently that work with administrators maybe learn from some of my mistakes. And so the last question I ask you, you look back in your career, you've done some amazing things. You get to like support. We were talking about, you have a, a an event coming up that, you know, is going to have kids from all over the world joining. So you have some incredible opportunities, but I guarantee that when you go look back at your first year of teaching, you, there's things that you wish you'd have done differently. So if you go back and talk to your first year teacher self, what advice would you give? My, the advice that I would give them, a chapter in the book, and I have a quote that begins every chapter, and the quote that begins the chapter I have on assessment says, Mr. McKenna, is this going to be graded by literally thousands of kids throughout my entire academic career? I hated that question when I taught, and I didn't realize at the time, though, the reason why that question was being asked is because that was the incentive structure that I had created in my classroom. It wasn't about, it wasn't about student learning, however we want to view learning, learning how to collaborate or learning how to get better at a particular skill or just having that growth mindset and being open to learning and realizing this is something that I can actually do. Instead, I treated assessment as something that was done to a student as opposed to something right. that's done with a student. That's a John Hattie term that I stole from him. It's not mine. But that's that. I think that's really a profound thing that I would want to share with myself as a first year teacher. Treat assessment as something that's done with the student as opposed to something that's done. I think that's an important skill because when you're talking about that, if kids are always like driven by those grades, what happens when grades don't exist outside of school? Yeah. This misconception, I think this is a conversation I've had with lots of groups. Grades are the end all be all of what we do in education. But someone who used to hire teachers, used to hire staff, I didn't look at their grades because I know there is a lot of teachers who had amazing grades who weren't great teachers. And there's a lot of great teachers who are terrible students and actually had bad grades. And so understanding there's something more to it than going back to that notion of what is valued and what is valuable or could be two different things in education. And really, when you talk about students doing that process with, I think it's eventually so that they can learn to assess themselves without you. So like when they're walking out of the schools that they can actually identify their strengths, where they need to grow those areas. Because if you actually just do that for them, what happens when they leave, when they can't do it for themselves? So I love that. Jason, it is awesome to talk to you. I'm like, I loved your stories and your connection. For all of you that are listening, I encourage you to check out Jason's book, What STEM Can Do For Your Classroom, Improving Student Problem Solving, Collaboration and Engagement. If there's any indication of the stories you shared today, I'm sure it's gonna be a smash hit. So I appreciate you being here today and I appreciate you all for listening to Jason and I, and look forward to another podcast with Jason coming up.